Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Anthony Diorio. He's a return guest. And, and the, the great thing about Anthony is every time you talk to him, he's going to tell you about three new projects he's starting right now. Uh, he's, he started an insane amount of projects in, in the space. Uh, so he's known for, uh, which is where we recorded the last episode with him, uh, Decentral, which was kind of a cryptocurrency uh, space, blockchain space in Toronto. He also started uh, CryptoKit. He's the founder and CEO of CryptoKit. And then he's a co-founder of Ethereum. And he's also a chief digital officer of the Toronto Stock Exchange. And it's kind of exploring blockchains in that context. So lo lots of activities. And of course, he's going to also doing some other things that we'll, we'll be talking about. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming on, Anthony. Brian, thanks for having me again. Nice to meet you, Sebastian. Yeah, so last time we talked, I was actually in Toronto and, and I got, came to your space. You, you, had a, you guys had a really nice space, which was sort of a, a big house in the middle of the financial district. And we recorded an episode with you and, and a, few of, a few other people there that were part of, um, I think, the, what was it, the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada? Yeah, well, people, people that worked Energy Central at the time, yeah. So can you give us an, an update? What's, what's been going on with Decentral? Sure. So we opened Decentral in January 2014. It was literally a month after uh, we jumped into Ethereum, and that became the first the first hub for Ethereum. We had co working space there, and we were doing our meetups out of there. It was basically a hub that we set up because I'd been involved in the in the in the space for a while, doing meetups in Toronto, and. As a local Bitcoin seller, we would meet at coffee shops and do things. And then it's like, I got to get a space put together. We got to have some place that everybody can kind of gather around and we can get that community formed and do our meetups and that. So I opened up Decentral in January, 2014. The same day we opened up uh, Toronto's first Bitcoin ATM. It was a bit access machine. It was, they'd approached me a couple of weeks earlier and said, hey, we're starting to make ATMs. Would you like to be our first customer? So we opened that up there. And it's really morphed into many, many different things, Decentral. It's, uh, uh, we had 5,000 square feet initially. We would do all our meetups and events there. We had co-working space. We had a bunch of our projects there. We, we, had, we had, you know, it was, again, the first Ethereum hub. We were hiring people for the initial, for the initial team out of there. And it's morphed into a bunch, into, you know, I, we moved last year. We moved because we started doing our events in a much larger space. Uh, we have a, a development center called Mars in Toronto. It's a massive, massive, like million square foot facility. And we do our, our events at their auditorium so we can fit 600 people there. So it, it just didn't make sense to have event space at Decentral anymore when we were doing much larger events elsewhere. So we downsized, we, we got rid of the co-working space. And basically as my projects grew, we just realized having everybody working on my projects there seemed to what it, make the most amount of sense and a lot less uh, distractions from other things going on. So Decentral's, it's a, it's a, it's a hub. We still do our events out of here for smaller ones. We've got our Bitcoin ATM, a very active Bitcoin ATM. Uh, we've got 40, 50 people every day coming in, purchasing and, and, and buying and selling Bitcoin. Uh, we do all our projects operate out here. So CryptoKit operate, operates out of here. Our consultancy services out of here. Uh, Decentral TV, which we're gonna start pushing a little bit more. Yeah, so everything's, everything revolves around Decentral. It's kind of the, the, the parent company to all our activities. That's fascinating. And also I, had, I, had, I hadn't really realized how the sort of Ethereum community had uh, started there in Toronto, which, which is obvious because you know, Vitalik is from the Toronto area. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I'm originally from Canada, but I've been in France for the last 10 years or so. And uh, from a distance, I hadn't realized that it had all sort of started there. Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting story. I can, can get into a little bit of how that, that whole thing emerged, if you yeah, want. Yeah, sure. It, so the first meetup I did, it was in 2012. It was, I, I literally heard about Bitcoin summer of 2012. I, that day I went out seeking a Bitcoin and I went out and found someone on local Bitcoin. I met up with them, bought my first Bitcoin. I think it was like $9.75. And I looked for a community in Toronto. I like, there's, I looked on meetup.com, like there's nothing here. There's absolutely nothing. So a month after learning about Bitcoin, I started, I said, like, I'm going to start this community. So I hold, held the first Toronto Bitcoin meetup group and event. And at that event, there was 10 people and there was Peter Todd was there. Uh, Vitalik Buterin was there, um, and 
that's where I first met those two guys. And then consistently doing events after that's how I got to know them. That's how um, just as, as we grew, we started doing like weekly events and it just grew and grew. We moved from different, different, different bars. And, and then when we launched CryptoKit uh, in 2014 in November, uh, I'd invited uh, Vitalik, Roger Ver and Eric Voorhees to be part of the team. Basically, there were three guys that I really respected in the space. And I said, you know, I'd love to have you guys. Here's our product. We think it's really cool. Uh, you know, it's a Chrome extension, the first of its kind wallet, no logins or passwords, it grabs addresses from the page. You open it when you want. We'd really tried to remove the friction. And they all love the product. It was actually in Argentina when I approached Roger and Eric to, to join CryptoKit. So there's literally five of us that, that move forward on the project with it. And even though they've been at the distance, and this was Vitalik, you know, had, was crucial in some of the things that we did with CryptoKit. It was literally a month after that when he showed me the white paper and said, "Hey, this is what I this is what I've been work, what we've, I've been putting together." I was the, I think the first person he showed it to, and that was a month after launching CryptoKit. And then it was like full on Ethereum. We we dropped, I not drop CryptoKit. It was it's been going ever since. And. Uh, we just focused headlong onto Ethereum, and I brought in Charles Hoskinson of the project, and he brought in Mihai, who was his partner with Bitcoin Magazine, and Amir Chetrit, who he'd been working with on Colored Coins, and it was the five of us. So we were the five initial founders of the project, and it started just developing mostly out of Toronto, and we started hiring people and out of Toronto, and that's where we started the initial meetups. And, and then in, in, in January, it was the, 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 we really came out and that was at the Miami Bitcoin conference. So that was the, where things really started taking off. The community started expanding and then Jeffrey and Gavin came in afterwards and Joseph Lubin, who actually was at the very first decentral opening day on, on New Year's day of 2014, Joseph Lubin showed up and Joseph, of course, from consensus, he had been uh, traveling, uh, he was living in Jamaica at the time and had traveled to, to Toronto visiting uh, some family over the Christmas holidays and he came to the event and that's where we connected. We invited him to Miami to the conference and that basically was the initial eight that, 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 you know, this, the initial five. And then a few months later, we added three more founders to the team and that was the core eight that, that formed out of that. So that was literally a lot of the action and activity out of Toronto. And then we started uh, setting up things in Switzerland and other hubs formed. And then it just grew into that massive project where you guys are, are very well familiar with. Yeah, and then then from there, um, did did some of the what's the community like now in in Toronto? Like, the, oh, it's so the diverse. Ethereum now. Community. There's there's tons of meetup groups here. There's two Ethereum meetup groups here. Uh, there's just, I mean, since since opening the first one in 2012, there's there's probably dozens now. Like, I don't know. There there's there's so many events that are going. It's such a major thing and. And it's really cool. Is it's, 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 it's like Decentral has kind of been that that center of gravity where uh, everybody and everybody in the space now has kind of come through Decentral in some way or another, and off doing projects in the space. And it's been it's been really interesting as the community has developed. And and uh, I've kind of always been on a year basis of things that I do. The first year in 2012, 2013 was kind of building out that community. It's like there's nothing here. If I want to be part of this and I'm really passionate about, it, I'm going to, you know, I want to be the center. I want to, I want to build out the community. And I think that's what's needed. And that's how you start learning about cool projects. Community is like a key word for me and, and, and building out things like that. I think things, companies need to build communities around themselves. And I'll get more into that when I talk about the Toronto Stock Exchange, but it's, that's what 2012 and 2013 was about was, was building out the community. 2014 was, was big push onto Ethereum. 2015 for me with Decentral was a lot more getting businesses involved. It was the start of, of NASDAQ's announcements that really kind of drove uh, the business community to start investigating blockchain. And, you know, this was three years down the road after I've already gotten into it, many other people, and I got in kind of relatively late, you could say. But it takes businesses that amount of time uh, to get involved in these disruptive technologies. You can first get the communities and, and the passionate people working on it. And then years later, you seem to get the, the businesses that start looking into it. So 2015 was about, uh, for me, businesses, and we saw the growth in Toronto of, of a lot of activity from Deloitte, Canada, from the banks all starting to get their projects together and start thinking about it. And and then for me, 2016 now is, is focused on expanding that and getting out to policymakers in Canada and really uh, tie-ins with with educating on these disruptive technologies and the benefits that they can offer to our country and how jobs are meant to be created and how we can really push ourselves forward. So. 
that's kind of the, been the progression and the community's grown along the way. Uh, we had in 2014, we put on the Bitcoin Expo in Toronto. We had, I think, 800 attendees to that, 40 exhibitors. So yeah, it's been a, a real growth in the community and a lot of excitement and a lot of diversity now. Many different meetups, uh, many different people organizing events. And it's really great to see it, you know, the, the, the change and, and, and people starting to take initiatives and leaders starting to grow and form here. It's been really cool. Can you talk about some of the positions? So, I, you know, in Canada, there's been uh, quite a few reports and positions uh, from either the government or the Senate. Can you talk about the sort of general position of the Canadian government on digital currencies and blockchains? Sure. So, it, it, they've, I think, done a great job so far in not rushing into any decisions. There's still very little uh, regulations around around uh, crypto right now. For example, uh, if you're if you're selling or buying or selling, you really don't have any regulations or rules right now. So you can, there's no limitations. Uh, there will be some in the future that come out. So I guess you know, uh, money services business license will probably be needed in the future, but they're not right now. Uh, you can literally sell from a Bitcoin ATM without taking customer information right now. It's been really good, and I think it's at the smartest move is that taking that time to really understand these technologies. Um, the governments are are seem to be wanting to learn and wanting to educate themselves, and, and understanding that you know rash decisions probably aren't the best the best thing to do, and they can really hinder the growth of of of, of technologies and industries that uh, your country can be leaders in. And I, that's I've been very happy with the progress, and by them taking their time. I mean, we had Andreas come up. Uh, and speak at a Senate committee hearing. And I think he really was able to bring across that message of wait, see, educate yourselves, and don't don't jump to anything um, anything rash. Just kind of really understand. And that's what we've gone through the, again, the cycle for me is community learning and getting into it, businesses learning, and then the next stage is, is governments and, and regulators and policymakers. And it's really our goal and our challenge to educate them and to bring about that, that passion for these technologies and how Canada can be at the forefront of these technologies and lead it if we are embracive to the technologies, if we are encouraging entrepreneurs, encouraging startups, encouraging fintech companies to come in and, and making sure that there's nothing that, that's stopping them. I mean, I, I look at what the UK has done and it's, I think it's done a really good model of, of promoting fintech. And I think even just the last couple of days that they've announced a, a sandboxing system where they can actually have gray area companies that are involved in disruptive tech tech uh, feel comfortable investigating what they're they're getting involved in and that they're not going to be challenged on the regulatory side where they can actually have a sandbox that they can work within so they can start investigating and i think that's really important is, is in a global marketplace governments really need to understand that they have the opportunity to embrace rather than be scared of these technologies and that as we've seen with the internet and many other things, it's the 99% of the amazing things that are going to come out of it that they should be focusing on. And again, new sectors that emerge and new jobs that will be created. And I think it's the, the the not having a fear system and saying, we got to be really worrisome about what the, the negative things could come out of, but it's, it, it, they have to be brought to, it has to be brought to light and they need passionate leaders and people that can present the, 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 the vision of where Canada can be and where your country can potentially be in a global economy. And I think it's it's something that the leaders and the advocates and passionate people in the space have to really be pushing and getting in front of those stages in order to present that that idea. That has been one of the exciting things to see, just how much has been going on in Canada, given you know it's it's not a huge country, but in terms of activity, it has definitely been sort of at the forefront with, with startups and community activity, especially in Toronto. So, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. I just want to say uh, it's not a huge country. It's the second largest country in the world. Just uh, as I think a... we know. I think we know what Brian means, though. It's not a huge <laughs> by population, but uh, it's a massive. Well, there's community. two Canadians on this call, Brian. You're you're a minority. Here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Of course, it's, that's it, right. is, it is great not only in its size but also in its spirit. Yeah, um, and it's there's been a lot of good companies and a lot of good activity that's come out of such a such a you know small populous country. We've had you know, bid access and what they've done in the ATM space, uh, CoinKite, you know, who unfortunately shut down their wallet recently, but they've always did, done a good job. And there's a lot of number, you know, number of exchanges and a lot of good things that, that I mean, heck, you can say Ethereum came out of here too. And a lot of, a lot of good things. And uh, it's been really cool to see the, the, the progression in Canada. Absolutely. So what, one of the projects you've been working on is CryptoKit, which was a browser extension you mentioned it briefly. 
And now a, a new thing you guys have launched is, is called JAX, right? So J-A-X-X. -X. It's a wallet that uh, both handles Bitcoin and Ethereum and, I was, uh, and Ether. And I was just downloading it before, setting it up, uh, you know, on my phone, on the computer. Really nice. Um, what made you start um, or launch that wallet? Sure. So I'll give you the whole. I can give you the whole progression here. Uh, CryptoKit came about because of a gaming site that we had previously, where basically we were, we were almost a wallet at the time, and we decided to. We wanted to create a wallet that just didn't have any friction. Uh, didn't have usernames. Didn't have passwords. weren't needed. Uh, didn't have to log into websites. Uh, so that was the Chrome extension that we developed. And then a long break because of Ethereum. And then after the crowd sale, when, when the funding, you know, I'm more on the business side and a lot of the, the initial founders uh, basically went, went other ways uh, because of the, you know, the funding came in, it was to going for developers. So I had a chance to, to get back to my other projects and, and we, we created rushwallet.com, which is our HTML5 Bitcoin wallet, the CryptoKit design. And then we spent about a year because we, we have a lot of customers coming into the ATM and, and it's always been, you know, what wallet should we download? And the first question after they ask that is, what we have to ask them is, well, what kind of device do you have? Well, if you're on Android, you want to download this wallet. Or if you're on iPhone, you want to download this wallet. But you can't get that wallet on iPhone because it's only on Android. And you can't get that one on Android that's only on iPhone. And if you want to use it on your desktop, well, you can't use either of those two. So you have to use a different wallet. So we really got to learn what what the customer or what new users would want. And the goal was set to develop a cross-platform unified wallet that looked the same on every device. And the way we've done this is by creating a single code base. We create everything we do is JavaScript and HTML. And instead of having to keep update on one app and then develop the other one counter to that, which you see everybody is kind of doing, they'll develop the Android app and they don't do the iPhone because it's a separate code base and they can't keep up production of different features and things, so they design it differently and that has to look differently. What we want to do is really come up with that one user experience that you could use on your, your desktop, on your laptop, on your iPhone, on your Android, on your Chrome extension, your Firefox extension, on your desktop, Linux, Android, sorry, Linux, window. Windows and, and Apple. So we created this, this platform that was developed around a single code base. And the single code base allows us to wrap the app, wrap it up on a different platforms and deploy in a matter of like an hour. We can put out to our nine different platforms and we can put new features in in one code base and then deploy so rapidly. And we just take advantage of the, of the onboard cameras or data or local storage, which is the only things that we really need to do differently. And the rest is all a single code base. So you, what you end up getting is a a unified experience no matter which device you're using. We've got three desktop versions. We have two extensions, Firefox and Chrome. We have Android tablet, Android mobile. We have iPhone tablet, iPhone mobile. Um, so, and then to be able to push out new fixes that go across them all without needing to worry about separate code bases allows us to be very flexible, very agile and, and rapidly deploy. So we've had, I think we launched about a month and two weeks ago, our betas for Ether and, and Bitcoin. And I think, yeah, they were the first, the first Ethereum wallets, the, uh, the first Ethereum mobile wallets, the first extensions. And we, we now can, we put out 18 versions so far. So we've had 18 beta versions. Uh, that we put out, and we can literally put them a day apart if we want. We can. We people ask us for a feature, no problem. We got that single code base. We pop the feature in, we deploy it, we wrap them up, and deploy them across all the devices. You can sync between all devices. So by scanning a QR code, you can sync your extension, or you can sync your Android, your iPhone. Uh, it's got a, a single page experience. So everything you need is on one page. You're not flipping the different pages. We designed it in such a way that it doesn't look like it's cluttered. Uh, we use animations really well, and we have that that ex that experience that, you know, with some wallets you have to kind of find where the, your QR code is, you got to find where your address is, or you have to find how to send and receive. We really want to simplify the process. We want to make it very easy for people to use, and we wanted our customers coming in to use the ATM to go which which wallet should I download, and we can tell them no matter what they're using it for, they should they can download Jax. So that's really what we tried to do is we wanted to unify the experience across devices. We wanted to offer Ethereum and Bitcoin. We want to bring those communities together. There's no reason for a lot of the, 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 you know, the negativity between people that, that don't like Ethereum. And the big, really, this is, this, they, they complement each other. I think they're both extremely useful. I'm a big fan for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And we're going to be adding a lot of other coins as well. 
our plan is to be adding the next stages. Uh, we're launching the, the 1.0 version, so we've got the audits done with Sergio Lerner and his team from CoinSpec uh, do the audits, which I think is really important. Uh, we also are very passionate about customer service. My, my cell number is literally everywhere. If you want to call me, talk about the wallet, I'm here. That's a very important thing for the space as well, to show transparency and to show that we're accessible and that I'm putting my name behind this. I'm putting a name behind what we do. We never hold or have access to customer funds. Everything's stored client side. We don't require any information or uh, from the users. Um, you know, it's things that we've learned that I've learned across the last few years, and things that you can't really learn by just getting into the space new. You have to kind of understand where the faults are with other wallets, understand where the issues were with people holding onto other people's keys and coins. That's something I don't want to ever have to take responsibility for. Our code is, is not open source right now, but our code is fully auditable and available on our site for, for inspecting. Um, so it's, it's, it's a business that I run with CryptoKit. It's something that I've been, been doing for three years. Uh, we put you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the project. It's been funded by myself. Uh, and it's a project that we think can be the default wallet in the space, no matter which coin you're dealing with, no matter uh, which country you're in. So internationalization is a big play for us down the road is really making this the uh, on, on all app stores across China. I was just in Shanghai last week and understanding that that they're a completely different culture out there. And, well, culture, yeah, but a completely different animal in terms of the way that they treat wallets or the way that they download apps. And, and I think the community in North America and Europe hasn't done a very good job of reaching out to China. So that's one thing we really want to push. And I want to get them out to India, all these different app stores around the world. We want this to be that default wallet, the easiest one to use, the one you can use on multiple devices. And now we're going to start popping in integration. So we got Shapeshift coming in. We've got all these integrations, ways to buy Bitcoin now. Because we don't take custodianship of customer funds, we don't have to worry about, about regulations with our wallet. We can then partner with localized country, localized um, companies and countries that are already offering services to buy Bitcoin. Uh, for example, we're going to be having Glidera in there. We're going to be having Shapeshift. We're going to work probably with Unocoin in India. We're going to work with places in China. So depending wherever you are, it's going to say, hey, this is a, this is a service you can, apply, you can use to buy Bitcoin, and you can do it directly into JAX. So default wallet that can be used across all devices on all app stores around the world, multiple coins, integrations. We really think we have a good opportunity in play to become that default wallet in the space. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I, I agree. I think that's needed. And, and you guys have definitely already at the sort of stage nailed a lot of things like really well. Uh, now, what, one thing I'm curious about here, most listeners are probably somewhat familiar, at least with SPV wallets and Bitcoin. So wallets that don't have a full node, but they still have a, a pretty good level of security. Um, how does that work uh, on the Ethereum side here? Is this also an SPV wallet or is it yeah, so, more some? Yeah. So we're using etherscan.io right now to push transactions and show balances. Okay, it's, we are a, a light wallet. We've always used other people's APIs in order to push transactions and show balances. So for the longest time with CryptoKit and our extension, we always just used blockchain.info. Okay, that was the way that we were using to push transactions and show balances. Uh, right now we're using blocker.io on the Bitcoin side for, for JAX. Uh, when Blocker went down a few weeks ago, we realized, we, and we've always known we need to add redundancy. So we've been working and we have now have three, we have, we have a system in place that, back, that basically is a, uh, um, if, if one goes down, we've got two others in place on the Bitcoin side. So we're working with blocker.io, we're working with BlockCypher, and we're working with blockchain.info, and we can actually pop in other ones as we want to add redundancy. So we use them to basically just push the transactions and to show balances. The keys are stored locally on, on, on the client device, never leave the client device. So th there's no security issues in that sense. Um, we've got on the, on the Ether side, we only have the option of, of, of etherscan.io right now. And that doesn't, it's not where we'd like it to be. So we've actually got the Coin Fabric team right now, the guys from, uh, um, from uh, Argentina, and that's uh, Sebastian and, uh, and uh, uh, Sergio Lerner are part of these teams. They're, they're, they're guys that work with us on, on larger projects. So we've got our in-house developers and we also outsource uh, larger projects to those guys. And they're doing right now, they're, they're getting a full node set up for us in server because we realized a lot of the libraries and a lot of the um, a lot of the APIs and things in Ethereum really weren't up to where we needed them to be. And we've realized that we need to create a lot of our own stuff. 
So we had been working on some of the JavaScript stuff that Ethereum had come up with. We had found some bugs and issues with it. Uh, we had presented to the community, which is great. And then we realized that we need to, we need to tailor some of this to our own needs. So our eventual goal is to have the backups of these, these, these third-party services, but to have our own full nodes that are going to be running it. So we are getting it set up on the Ethereum side. We're not doing it as of yet on the Bitcoin side because there's enough redundancy in some of the other providers right now that we don't need to really focus on that. And then we're going to be setting up our system for dealing with all of the other coins that we're going to be integrating. And the path for the other coins is basically, if it's on Shapeshift, we're going to offer that coin. That's our that's our judgment call for for adding new coins to this to to Jax. It's we're like, we're going to push that off to them. We're not going to decide which ones people might think are are not coins we should be getting into, and we'll use them as that litmus test. Where if Shapeshift offers it, you're going to be able to get that into Jax. So we're going to have to figure out those services as well and how we're going to be doing those because. Companies like Block, Blocker.io, uh, they don't offer. They only offer a few different coins. So we're going to have uh, our own. We're going to probably be setting up our own servers for a lot of them. But we're getting that worked out now. So now, for now, we're using third-party services. The goal is to use our own down the road and have the third parties as backups. So one of the major sort of hurdles to uh, wallet adoption, I think, is is security and just having keys stored on your local machine or on your local phone, uh, even for small amounts, I don't think is particularly a good practice. And what has emerged is, um, as, I guess, a better a better practice, uh, and this is you know, our, our sponsor, Ledger, that does this, is that you, know, you sign on a separate device, having a hardware device that does the signing. And I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good um, solution for having a wallet that's functional and being able to have security at the same time. Uh, do you plan to integrate that sort of thing into Jax? Like, and 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 how will you uh, implement if you do, if you are implementing hardware security? How will you do that on all of these different coins? Sure. So you know what? I disagree that I think that you for for small amounts or amounts a user might be customer uh, comfortable with that. I disagree that uh, having keys on your local device is some type of security issue, or, or that it might not suffice for a person who wants to keep 50 bucks or 100 bucks on their device and not have to have a separate device in order to send those those type of transactions. So it all comes down to choice and it all comes down to to usability and, and customer experience. And what we've learned in the space is that people want all kinds of options. So they want the option of having a device that, like I do, where I don't even want a password on my phone. I don't want a password to send Bitcoin. I'll decide how much Bitcoin I want to keep on that device. And I'll take responsibility that if something were to happen or someone gets my phone, that they could do it. Now, I could add a pin on my phone if I want. That'll help me. I can add a pin into Jax if I want on top of that as well. So that'll help me even further if I want. It all comes back to users and what the user wants to do. And it comes down to choice. Our model has always been we want to offer the least amount of friction in a system. Okay, so we don't we don't force we don't force passwords. We will put a, a notice there saying, "Hey, you might be able to you might want to add a pin to your account. That's your choice." And then we want to take it all the way up to, "Hey, if you want to be securing large amounts, hardware device, we've got that coming out. We actually have had a prototype done uh, last year, and this is something that we're going to be be implementing." So I believe there's a full range, and it's not about saying it's not secure. It's saying whatever the customer or the user feels is they should have that choice and option. And then they should have different levels that they can add security or add different ways of doing it right up to that cold storage system. So it's, 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 I like flexibility. I like being given that choice. I don't like being forced into things no matter what it is. So that's what we've always tried to do with, with, with CryptoKit. Passwords are always been optional. We want to have a great user experience. And we still believe that since everything is client side and you have an option on your phone, if you can put a pin on there and then you add a pin onto crypto, onto Jax, that's kind of you know I'm 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 pretty comfortable with that system and I and I would be pretty comfortable telling people that I think that, that that's a a good system, and if you want you can use the desktop versions you can eventually we'll be having where you can add a hardware device to it. We are talking to Trezor, but we're also coming up with our own system. Cool. Now one of the interesting things is that if you compare you know Bitcoin to Ethereum, of course with Ethereum you have all these other things like uh, contracts, uh, and and DApps which add a whole level of complexity, right? Because maybe you're not just sending a sim simple transaction, but you know, you're doing something more involved. Uh, how do you plan to handle that in JAX? Do you, it, will, is there some kind of unified way you can handle that or would you have to do something kind of new for every single DAP and then you know, add sort of add DAPs the same way you add different 
uh, coins? Well, the first star for us was, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen, but we've got an advanced send feature on the Ethereum side that enables custom gas and adding data. So you can now, you can send the contracts uh, through through JAX now. So we've got a little drop-down menu that comes up that says, here's the recommended gas price that you should be sending to this contract. So it actually identifies first that it is a contract. So you put the address in, it identifies whether it's a contract or it's a payment address. If it's a contract, it pops open the advanced features and says, okay, here's some things that you can do differently. You can change your gas price. We recommend putting 100,000 gas. You can change that to whatever you want. And here's a field where you can add custom data that you can send to the contract. So that's our first stage in actually differentiating between the Bitcoin and Ethereum sides is, is the ability to send to contracts. The way that we're going to be handling dApps and the way that we're going to be handling you know, I don't want to get into it too much because we have some big ideas on the hardware side that we're working on right now and the way that we're going to be offering a, 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 a browser similar to what Mist is trying to achieve. Uh, our goal is to is to basically have that, that DAP Explorer that we're going to be building in and we, we'll be announcing some of those things in, in the near future. Uh, but yes, it is, a, it is a main thing for not just not to be a wallet. Ethereum is not just not about being a wallet. It's about contracts, it's about sending contracts, it's about being able to access your, your apps. So that is definitely something that we're going to be focusing on. The last thing we want to do is just to be this wallet that you're sending transactions for, for, for Bitcoin or for, sorry, for Ethereum. It's much more behind, beyond that, and we're planning to really push forward with that. Everything we do is about user experience, and I think it's been sorely missing in the Ethereum community so far. What we do is we do, we're doing products for the masses. Our wallet is for the masses. It's being made for the, for the person who doesn't want to sit behind, uh, behind the command line. That's what we do. Education-wise, we focus on, uh, and I focus on, things that, that my dad would be able to use, that things that, and we do it in language that, that, that eighth graders can actually achieve. So we put out infographics explaining what Ethereum is. We do it in a way that really breaks down what it is. So there's a lot of devs that are focusing on, on Ethereum, and that's great. We need to build out that community. My focus is how is this going to get beyond the developers, and how are we going to create things that the everyday person are going to be, other people are going to be able to use. So that's our focus, and for me, it starts with design. It starts with, with user experiences, user displays, um, and, and through that, we're going to start getting this message out to the general populace about the power of Ethereum and how it'll be being used in the next few years. So it's not just for us about a wallet or even sending the contract. It's going to be about how are you exploring your, your Ethereum contract? How are you exploring your decentralized applications? How is that store that we're, that we're planning on developing for your dApps going to be, going to be done? And, and how will that be experienced by users? How will it be used in your entertainment system at home, on your TV? These are kinds of things that we're focusing on with our hardware devices, and that'll tie into the wallet. It'll offer cold storage and a bunch of other things. And excited to announce those first pictures uh, in the next week or so. Uh, is there a unified way that you can do sort of HD wallets across all of these different coins with only one seed where you, know, you can do like one seed backup and basically your whole Jax wallet just pops up? Funny you ask, and I'm wondering if you already knew that that's what it does. Uh, so we developed Jax in specifically to do that. So we have a single key, a single seed system, mnemonic, 12, 12 uh, words that basically will allow you to derive any keys for any coin anything in the future okay that one backup you write down those 12 words you keep it somewhere safe that's all you'll ever need for your hd ethereum for your bitcoin ethereum so i'm not sure if you're aware we just we were the first to launch hd ethereum it just went out on our most recent beta launch uh it's we developed it uh with with some interaction with the ethereum community but we basically came up with it we decided how it should be we're the first ones to launch it it's working really well right now uh, and that single seed that you have from your initial install, you write it down, put it away somewhere safe, and that's all you'll ever need. You can, you can, any other coin that we're adding in the future, that one seed will derive in an HD fashion all the coins and, and, and your keys for every single thing that you'll ever need, including PGP. We actually put PGP into the Bitcoin curve. So what we did is we took, and we took the PGP curve and we put it into the open PGP JS library which means that now you can, with your single seed that you're getting with your Bitcoin keys, you're getting your Ethereum keys, you can also get out get your PGP keys. So communications for us, identity and payments is the three pillars that we do our products on. The payment side is obvious. That was the initial, uh, when we even did CryptoKit in, 13, in 2013, we had the payment side. We also integrated PGP in CryptoKit. 
where you could then send encrypted messages through the system as well. We actually made PGP very easy in 2013. We were the first to really simplify the experience for PGP. We then will realize that you're still with having issues with um, having to send your public keys to people and it wasn't very efficient. So we wanted to bring the one seed and we, we, we commissioned again the guys from CoinFabric to put the curve into Bitcoin and basically put the, the PGP key uh, curve into OpenPGP.js library. So our goal is in the future to have, and we have one name integration in, in JAX, so you can actually send to one names. The goal in the future is also to be able to send messages again by just typing in somebody's name and potentially through the one name system, potentially on our own system that we're developing for Ethereum. We believe when you have payments, identity, and messaging, those are the three cornerstones that you need for any application. And all done in a decentralized fashion uh, is, is the way to go. Like we're literally, I think, a few years ahead of where the fintech industry is in terms of, again, not collecting user data, not holding on to customer funds, not not having access to customer identities, customer use, like all these things that we've been developing for a few years now is where I think the future is and where it's going, and hence our name, Decentral. We try to, we, all, we only create things that are decentralized, things that can live on their own, things that if we ever go down, they can be imported into other, into other systems with the standards that we use. So, and that all comes back to, again, that single seed, it's the way we design things, it's the way that we can now add coins in the future, and everything can be derived from that, 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 that individual single seed. Is that something that could also be implemented in other wallets, or is that specific to to Jax? Like, if I can, could I use that seed on, like, let's say the Ethereum wallet or like a yeah, so standard Bitcoin wallet? What's going on now is kind of the standards are being developed, and we we feel we've come up now with the standards for how Ethereum is handling HD. So that kind of is going to be pushing other people to be integrating those standards on the HD side for Ethereum. If we get there first and it's, people agree that that's the way that it should be done, that then becomes a standard. And then Ethereum wallets that get developed will be using that standard, which would again, yes, can tie into our, our seed system. It doesn't matter if you are just a Bitcoin wallet, like you can take our seed and you can put it into Mycelium. You're then gonna get your Bitcoin wallet. If they were to integrate Ethereum, now that single seed that you've taken from our wallet, put it into Mycelium, would also generate and derive your Ethereum keys if Mycelium decides to arrive, derive that. We basically created that standard that we think is going to be used for Ethereum, and it's you know still to be, to be to get there. I guess it's been had great response so far from the community. We think that we've done it in a proper fashion. We coordinated and we did get, you know, we we we, we asked if this was a way that we that this we think that this should be done. Do people agree? And it seems to be the way people think it should work. So yeah, that single seed can be used in other devices, and that, again, that's how we always do things. We don't want to be creating things that can only be used for us. And in case, God forbid, we ever go down, you take that seed, you put it in another wallet, you then have access to your funds. Cool, excellent. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing the continued development of JAX. Today's magic word is Canada, C-A-N-A-D-A. -A -A. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. Now, among your other projects, well, uh, let's let's briefly talk about your conference. So, so you put on a conference before, uh, which was the Big Expo in 2014. The the expo, uh, and now you're doing the the World Blockchain Expo this fall. Can you? What's different about this one, and what will be the focus here? Okay, so yeah, so the the, the Blockchain World Expo is a. It's an event that I'm contemplating. I, I had had planned to do one last year, and then, you know, and we talked about this, Brian, before we started recording here. Things things are changing all the time. There's you have to be so agile and fluid and pivoting, and as the industry develops, you have to completely be changing all the time. So, 2014, we did a Bitcoin Expo. This was for the community. It was a, really about bringing in. Uh, the community from around the world, the speakers, you know, we had Andreas there and we had uh, uh, Jeffrey Tucker and we had, uh, um, we had like 50 speakers of basically the who's who. We had, you know, Adam Levine was there. It, it, it was it was great. And it really, I had people coming away from that saying, you know, this is probably one of the best events that, that have been put on. It really was that community focus and that community feel. Um, it was something that I had seen in Argentina that I really enjoyed. Uh, when I was at the conference there, and that's what we really wanted to bring to, to Toronto. We had multiple multiple tracks there. We had a fire fire um, 
a fireside chat lounge. We had a banquet dinner the night before it kicked off. It was, it was a really great event. What's different about this one is now the focus is turning more towards, we've got the community. There's a ton of events going on in Toronto and in Canada. This is now really about getting more businesses understanding and demystifying blockchain, looking at the use cases, really trying to understand and break through that 95% of garbage that we're seeing out there and the press releases and really trying to dig down and say, okay, people need to understand what it's good for, what it's not good for. Stop trying to put things in the blockchain that were never made for blockchain. Start taking a, a holistic technology approach rather than we need to blockchainify this, we need to blockchainify that. It's not made for that. And you're going to be companies that we're, we're realizing, and we've been consulting in the space for, for, for a while now. After the NASDAQ announcement, in Canada, we were the ones that people started calling and saying, okay, uh, we're behind now, we need to get caught up, what should we do? We need to blockchain this, we need to blockchain that. It's like, okay, slow down. You need, you need, you've got problems is what you have. You got problems that need solutions, and you don't understand what technologies that might be out there in order to help you solve the problems. So, what we want to do with this conference is kind of learning from our from our clients, the banks, stock exchanges that we've taken on at Decentral here. It's really we want to demystify blockchain. We really want to get across what the power is of this technology. The power of this technology, I like to say very simply, is that. With the internet, you had communications, open up communications line globally. You could do it now without needing third parties involved, the mail system, media companies. We now can exchange value. We can exchange value globally. We can do it without third parties being in between. This is going to be a massive paradigm shift than what we're going to be used to, what we've been used to. You can now remove all of these unnecessary non-value added people from the equation, and you can be replaced by automation and systems coming out. And that's the massive shift that I want to get that people need to really realize. And that's this disintermediation that's going to be occurring down the road. This is why clearing and settlements in, in are, are going to get completely changed. And these are easy, you know, low hanging things that are going to be done in the future. If you're not adding extreme levels of value between human interaction, you're going to get wiped out. And if you don't adapt and if you don't figure out new ways to monetize and new ways to add value between individuals, you're going to be gone. That's basically what I'm trying to get across in this conference. It's that's what this technology is going to enable. It's also going to, um, you're going to understand what the, what the specific use cases are now, what's going to be available in a couple of years, what technology is ready now and what will be available in a few years, what's the, the noise and garbage and how do you really identify the ideas that people put onto a website and put a press release out and say, this is what we're doing. How do you break that down and say, yeah, that's, that's garbage. You know, I can tell by looking at that website that that idea is not going to fly. You don't have the people behind it. You have an idea, but the idea doesn't have any substance. It's really demystifying and breaking down. And, and, and I want this event to be the event that people go and come away from and say, okay, I understand what blockchain is. I understand what it can be used for, what it can't be used for. We want to have a massive, we're going to have a massive expo hall there where people can actually show the products that they're actually working on. There's nothing worse than companies that don't have any substance and don't have any anything tangible before they make their announcements or they come up with their ideas. With Ethereum, you know, that was one of the main reasons we waited so long before the crowd sales. Let's get those proof of concepts up. Let's get people working with it. Let's get them touching and feeling it before we actually ask them to contribute and buy something. It's what I've always done with all with my products. It's CryptoKit we do, and Jax. We don't say, this is what we're doing. We put it out and we say, here's what we've done. Use it, try it out, test it. There's, there's, there's a lot of noise, and I'm sure you guys are aware, a lot of noise and a lot of... Um, a fluff and garbage out there and it's really it's really has to be, be broken down and it has to be simplified because these businesses really don't get it and they haven't been in the space long enough to really get enough talent and get enough developers and people who do do it starting to work on their projects so I'm hoping this event is going to kind of bring everybody together in a way that we can demystify blockchain show what where that where the use and value is going to be in the next few years um, and that that's what we're trying to collaborate gather with this global event our focus is not just on Bitcoin, it's on blockchain, it's on other ones. We want everybody to come together and rally, but it's mostly a business and, and finance event uh, where we're trying to gather and say, listen, guys, this is where you should be focusing your attention. This is where you should be focusing your proof of concepts. Great. Uh, and this is going to be on September 19th, 21st, uh, blockchainworldexpo.com. Of course, we'll link to that and we'll also link to Jack. So if people are interested in... in Go to the event to trying it out. Uh, that you know, you'll be able to find that in the show notes. Now, with your so so you mentioned a little bit the consulting that you guys have been doing. Uh, in particular, I think you're very involved with the Toronto Stock Exchange. How did that 
come about and, and what's your role there? So again, 2015 was the influx of businesses and enterprise starting to look at blockchain. Again, it came after the NASDAQ announcement. So we started getting inundated by calls. Uh, we were getting called by, you know, Deloitte was one of our first clients, the, the guys that eventually became the Rubik's team. Uh, and we just started getting calls from banks and from exchanges and basically, okay, we're behind, we don't know what we should be doing. Can you help us to identify our strategies to move forward? So we started working and we started setting up a, a consultancy business in early 2015. And one of our uh, maybe third, fourth, fifth clients ended up being uh, uh, a company that, that was part of what's called the TMX Group. And the TMX Group is the, the group that, that basically owns many companies in Canada, in, including brokerage and, and clearing and settlements. So. We started working for them, and we basically, through that relationship and engagement, um, it was asked of me to become more of a permanent member of the team. And as of January 1st, I became the chief digital officer. It was a, it was a position that was created for me at the Toronto Stock at the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's not just the Toronto Stock; it's the TMX Group. It's like we have a number of companies, uh, and that's the that's the 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 umbrella company that that owns the Toronto Stock Exchange. It owns the Montreal Exchange. It owns the Natural Gas Exchange. It owns brokerage firms. It owns its clearing and settlements. It's basically we have the whole the whole system. So what I what I'm working with them on is digital capabilities, and not just in the blockchain space, but basically how do you take these digital capabilities and disruptive technologies and how do you become a disruptor? That's kind of the focus for me, is how do you work with organizations who really maybe haven't done um, companies like, like things like banks and things who maybe haven't done a great job of being flexible and agile and be able to really adapt new technologies. And, and how do you turn them into disruptors? How do you turn them into and how do you transform their transform culture, transform processes and so that they can embrace these new technologies? So I work there, uh, chief digital officer. I'm, as you can imagine, it's another thing that I'm doing in my different projects and, and I have very long days so I am I do 16 hour days so I, I'm between Decentral and there I'm back and forth all the time and but I love it and I, and I enjoy what I do and uh, um, it's kind of it's, it's my life right now and it's planned to be for the next the next few years and keep building out these in ecosystems and infrastructures and especially with Ethereum there's a big play there now to just build out all the tools that people need to start developing on it and uh, so this was kind of an, an add-on position. Um, I'm I'm enjoying it, and it's my goal to really help them. This 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 uh, this, this this organization that's that's so part of the Canadian culture that help help to move Canada forward as a whole. So I have I have a vision of where I want to take Canada, and TMX is is supporting that vision and helping me carry out different initiatives. And they're the main sponsor for the expo that we're putting on. And and then there's a couple other initiatives that 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 I'm going to be announcing. Uh, actually within the next week as well, that's really going to help move Canada forward in terms of fintech and innovation and bringing everybody together in collaboration and community. So that's what you know my strengths are, I think, is the community building and, and having people rally around and build up and get passionate people together and, 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 and sectors growing. And so that's what we're going to do. And the TMX is kind of helping, to, helping me to carry that out. And I'm in turn, I have a strategic partnership with them through both my consultancy firm and as, as chief digital officer. And when you talk about this, uh, you know, this emergence of uh, fintech uh, ecosystem in Canada, are you finding that it's mostly concentrated in Toronto and perhaps Montreal? Or, I mean, I'm I'm so far detached from that now since I've, I haven't lived there a long time. But uh, are, are we seeing sort of other startup hubs and fintech innovation happening in some smaller centers as well, or is it mostly focused on big cities? Yeah, it's. I'd say it's mostly focused on big cities. I mean, fintech is still a relatively new term and something that that I mean, many people don't don't quite uh, understand what it means. It's you know, it's finance and technology coming together. Since since two thousand and eight, we want we have since the crisis, you have you have users who want more choice. They don't have as much faith and trust in a lot of the institutions and. You've seen, you know, the technology companies, the Apples, and and companies coming in and starting to get involved in finance. Um, as I said, I was in Shanghai uh, about a week ago, and more than half of the traditional transactions of payments and things are now not going through their traditional banking sector. More than half of transactions and financial things are going through apps now, are going through social media apps, things like WhatsApp and and WeChat, and are are. Actually, I don't know if WhatsApp's part of it. WeChat and some of the other ones, basically, they're their whole payment networks now. 
it's been completely uh, in China because of the regulatory burden is really low that these, these companies can go and start disrupting things. So in Canada, it's been slower. UK, it's much further ahead. And it's my goal to really bring, I, I've got this, this vision to kind of bring together the community of both fintech, uh, I'm sorry, startups and institutions around this common play to work together to build out the infrastructure in Canada. We've seen difficulties with, with Bitcoin companies getting bank accounts in Canada. At the same time, you're seeing banks who want to get involved in blockchain and these technologies and asking these same companies to start doing work for them. And they're like, well, you can't even give us bank accounts. How do you want us to get going on this when we're struggling to do? So how do we get the, the, the environment better so that startups and disruptive techs can start using um, uh, the systems that, that, that everybody else can in order to, to help them grow? The big guys need little guys. Little guys need big guys. Little guys need bank accounts. The big guys need strategic partnerships. They need talent. It's really time for everybody to work together to build up the infrastructure on a common play. So it, it's 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 still very small in Canada. The fintech community is definitely growing. I have some initiatives that I'm that I'm announcing that's going to help bring everybody together around that common goal to get out to policymakers, start educating them, giving them a plan of saying here. We all got together and said, think that this is where Canada should go if they want to be a global leader, if they want to be at par with, with, with UK and at par with, 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 let's say, Singapore and some other places in China. We need to set up the infrastructure in a way that's going to encourage entrepreneurs, encourage startups, uh, encourage people to take risks, encourage people to, to get involved in these disruptive technologies and start forming communities around them and growing. We have an opportunity to create more jobs, create new sectors, and really figure out that when these massive disintermediation technologies really take hold, how are people going to make money down the road? That needs to be determined, and that's the million dollar question that nobody can answer right now is, as you're disintermediating people, where will these monies be? be where will money be made down the road? Where will these new monetization strategies come out? And they will get figured out. And the countries that, that, that start tackling and understanding these technologies will be the ones that get the edge, start realizing it, and start succeeding. And that's my goal of what we can do in Canada. And I'm really confident with the way that the, the regulators have kind of taken this weight back and see approach, that if we get to them and, and educate them and show them the positives that are going to come out of this the, the, the different benefits that Canada is going to achieve from this, I think we can actually do that. So it's growing. I think we need to accelerate it, though. We need to expedite it. And there's many plans and things that we can do in order to do that. And that's what my focus of really my thought goes into is strategizing on how, A, the TMX can get ahead. B, how the country in a whole can get ahead by everybody working together and facilitating community growth, uh, facilitating collaboration, cooperation, facilitating uh, education, showing passion for the things that we're doing and showing how we can really come ahead in this global, you know, this global economy. So we're almost at the end of our show, but this is one interesting topic we can explore perhaps a little bit before we wrap up, which is sort of at the intersection, right? So at the moment, there's a lot of interest in blockchains and, and this sort of work you do with the Toronto Stock Exchange, right? There's lots of that stuff going on. At the same time, you're very involved in the Ethereum community. Like, how do you see that playing out? Where do you think there's going to be kind of, will these uh, develop in uh, sort of in isolation and there will be a lot of impact on both sides? Or do you think there's going to be a, a kind of a, a merging of those two worlds down the line? I think we're still, we're waiting for those standards to be developed. We're waiting for the HTML. We're wait, waiting for the HTTP. We're waiting for those common elements. And this is like the biggest term I'm hearing, you know, meeting with, with, with R3 and meeting with uh, the guys from Hyperledger, meeting with, you know, IBM. And it's really given me the opportunity to really see what everybody's working for. And I think interoperability is like the key term now that's being used. It's, it's how are all these things, all these, these different projects going to be interoperable? And that's the most important thing, because if you want to exist down the road, you have to be interoperable. So for example, with JAX, if we created something that was proprietary, that wasn't being used by other people, why, why is someone going to want to use us? So I think the key is, until that, that those standards get defined and developed, and we'll probably get there, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I don't, some of these consortiums and the way that, that they're bringing in so many different, you know, banks and so I, I don't know how the efficiencies are in place that they're going to be able to come up with something I do believe it's the it's the Vitalics it's the it's these 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 people that are that are passionate and trying to solve these really complex problems are be the ones that are going to be doing it. I don't think it's going to be the banks I don't think it's going to be some of these larger companies we really need to embrace and start forming partnerships and alliances with 
these, 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 these organizations, these people, these technologies like Ethereum that, yes, are open. They're open systems that anybody can participate in. And that scares a lot of people because, to me, it's, it's either a you're putting up more walled gardens, which is what we're, we're trying to see with some of these consortiums, I think. And they're, they're saying the, they say the open source and they say this, but, or they say that the, you know, they've got the Linux project. That Really, anything that's got walled gardens that's, that's really slowing down participation is not going to be something in the future I think is going to succeed. I believe it's going to be the things like Ethereum, the open systems that anybody can participate in, are the ones that are going to have a trajectory and excel so much faster in terms of development, so much faster in terms of solving problems, because they can just appeal to so many more people to, to be the ones solving the problem. If you look at the community around Ethereum, if you look at the amount of, of people that are flooding into the, the developers, the, the problem solvers, the mathematicians that, are, that have taken hold and understand, you know, they're so passionate about the way Ethereum is going, those are going to be the ones that are going to solve the scalability issues, the problems that are going to, going to enable the, the, the globe and, and the global population to start using these systems. So that's my personal belief. I believe that it's going to be the open systems that will win out, the ones that, that don't have the barriers for people participating in and being involved in. And I think the other ones are just going to take so long, potentially these walled gardens, are just going to take so long for everybody to kind of figure out what they're doing with it. By the time they do, the open ones are going to just take off. Those are the ones I think that we need to start preparing for. There's going to be, a, I think, in the future that this technology, it's here, it still has limitations, it has scalability problems, but I believe it's going to be solved in the next few years. And I think that's the thing that we need to start focusing on, that, that this, these are the ones that, that everybody's going to be embracing. So that also doesn't have a very good business model behind it. And I don't know where some of these companies are going to be. they they got to figure new ways to add value, new ways to monetize, and I don't have the answer to that. But if you stay ahead of the technology, understand where it's going to be five years from now, and then work backwards, that's probably the best play rather than saying, we're going to have to try to, to ab abide by the current financial systems and we have to do things this way, so we're limited with technology. So, I don't know, that's my, my rant on that. Well, uh, Anthony, thanks so much for coming on today. It was, it was great talking to you as always. Uh, great to hear about all your projects and, and I'm we'll, we'll certainly be uh, watching out for the, the developments that come both on your wallet side, but also hopefully we'll, we'll hear some announcements to at some point about uh, what the effects are of your engagement with the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, and of course uh, the event that you're going to be putting on in September as well. So uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you very much. Just to let everybody know, with the JAX 1.0, we're expecting out very soon. The audited version, the official release is coming out. Um, yeah, that's at JAX.io. And then the, the Blockchain World Expo, September 19th to 21st in Toronto. Hope to see everybody there. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, indeed. And of course, we'll have links to, to all of this in our show notes. In our show notes. So, uh, for listen as well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as always, we're part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, so you can check out uh, this show and lots of other shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. And of course, you can subscribe to this on any podcast application or also on YouTube and watch it on youtube.com slash epicenter Bitcoin. And if you would like to, you can participate in our t-shirt contest, which basically means you got to submit a review on iTunes and then we will send you a t-shirt. And soon we'll also be able to send you new stickers, which Sebastian has been producing, but still has to ship to mine. Oh, it's they're, they're right easy. here. Okay, uh, shit, so it's backwards, but... Um... Yeah, yeah. Any, anyway, <laughs> anyway. You, you can imagine it if you can't see it. So soon, soon we'll, be, we'll be adding that to the t-shirt. So anyway, the, the next ones will all go out with some stickers as well. So uh, thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.